Can we? What does that mean? Is, is quantum information the unconscious? Is that you're saying? Well, no, no, no. If you haven't got a mic, it's not. It's not going. It's not. It's it's just going into the ether. So uh, no, I mean, we can't hear you without the microphone. Um, so, um, <laughs> and I know that's important to you, Lawrence. <laughs> um, there is a there is a an issue here, which is the uh, there was an issue of U.S. News and World Report that Stuart just mentioned on um, the science of the soul. I think it was called. And you, you were in the, the piece, you also mentioned uh, that Terry was there. There was some, com uh, would you like to say something from the neurocomputational perspective on this? Well, um, I mean, you could go and sit, it's fine. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, since uh, uh, you did raise my name in vain, I thought it would be <laughs> only fair to... I was hoping you'd comment. Um, so, uh, and I want to make this a general point, and not just to uh, respond to the lecture, and that has to do with uh, what we now know about mechanisms in the brain. We're still at a very early stage. Uh, we see a wide variety of signals. Uh, 40 hertz signal is a particularly interesting one because uh, you see it not just during the awake state, but also during sleep. In fact, the original experiments done uh, in uh, Wolf Singer's lab were anesthetized cats. Ketamine. And, um, but, uh, but that, that uh, I think uh, our understanding of those signals is, is, like I said, still very early days. We just don't really have enough knowledge yet to know either their significance or their biophysical mechanisms. So I just want to lay that on the table that we just don't know. I, I would, personally wouldn't bet on this one. Uh, but having been said, um, one of the issues that came up earlier today was the issue of, of, of reason and logic in providing uh, us with tools and techniques and science to actually get to the bottom of, of a problem and solve them in a way that you can really be uh, confident of. And, and this is something that Francis was echoed in his, his, uh, the quotes that I gave earlier. Um, so humans aren't very good at reasoning. I mean, it, it is true that you know, after a lot of training in a particular field, you can get pretty good at, you know, figuring out the right control experiments and figuring out exactly what you need to do in order to prove it, but often that doesn't even transfer to other fields. Uh, you know, you can easily make mistakes, and physicists are very good at this, by the way, when, um, when trying to uh, debug uh, the, uh, who was it, uh, the, the mystic, the uh, Uri Geller, right? It, there were, uh, it was two physicists that were taken in because they just didn't know anything about magic. They didn't know the right questions to ask. And in some ways, you know, the physicists are uh, Terry, pretty I'm good at reasoning. Spoons. You know, please. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to imply that. Although, you or know, you're implying that I don't have reason. No, 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 no. I'm, no, I'm just making a general point about reason, uh, and I'll get I'll get back in a moment to the issue. Um, where <clears throat> where I think rationality and reason really shine is um, in being able to go step by step through the evidence that you have, putting together rational arguments and writing a paper. But is that actually how we make discoveries? Right? You know, if you read a paper, you'll never figure out how they actually got to the point. And we all know, I mean, working scientists know that often it's an accident or often it's an idea you have in the shower. Where's, where do those ideas come from? They're not deductive. Often they're inductive from a lot of experiments and experience and something clicks and it's not something that you can program. It's not a computer. And what do you call this? Well, unconsciousness is kind of the grab bag for things that <clears throat> you're not aware of, things that are happening at a level in the brain where we don't have conscious access. Uh, and ultimately that's where intuition comes from and new ideas. And I think it would be a mistake to Ignore that and, and to, to you know, uh, shove it under the rug. I mean, you were a cool calculating scientist. We do things logically. We make deductions. It's true. That's one aspect of proving it to your colleagues. But that's not the whole story for science. And I think that we're using our brains in perhaps the same way that ordinary people, not ordinary people, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, you, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that humans use for solving problems in their everyday life. Pat Churchland tells this story that she teaches freshman logic. 
And, and it takes them a whole quarter to learn modus ponens. But these are students who are spectacularly good at solving social problems. Right? They can figure out what's happening with other people and other groups. And, and, and they're, they're really, really sophisticated in the narrow, day, narrow regime of social interactions. And it's clear that our brain has a lot of circuits in it. You, and I think that- Terry, Terry excuse me. I, I got to catch a plane. And I've been, what does this have to do with what I said? I, because I would say that intuition can, can no, be No, I'm trying to explain my a, quote to you that you, you know, botched. Okay, well. I, I, have, I have nothing against consciousness. So, Some of my best friends study consciousness. <laughs> Christoph Koch is a good friend of mine. But I'm, what I'm saying is that it's just the tip of the iceberg. And if you ignore the rest of what's happening in the brain, I think you're doomed to uh, going down the wrong road. Susan, Susan Neiman, do, do you actually still have a point on this? Or, or, yeah, you well, do. I, I had terrible trouble understanding what was being claimed, actually, and I'm very glad that a physicist also found it problematic because uh, I, ha I have no background in physics, I have no background in neurobiology, but I do know something about Plato, for example, and I sort of understand what it means to say that uh, certain values are embedded in a platonic universe. I don't know what it means to say that, uh, what was it, Kabbalic wisdom is in string theory? Well, th or my point there was that Many, many cultures have something. Native Americans have this. Hindus have this. Buddhists. Everybody has something like this. Well, something like what, though? I mean, I, I, like I felt platonic, a little... Platonic information embedded in the Planck scale. Something that could be explained by that. Um, look, I felt a little bit like Richard Dawkins talking about religion, that is, and saying, you know, if we have perfectly straightforward explanations of this, why do we need to appeal to religion? We can't I felt like appealing just to the religion and the philosophy because I didn't see what work the science was doing. So what would it mean to say, I mean, I have an idea of just, let's go back to Plato, I have an idea of justice, right? Um, and let's say that uh, I believe everybody's born with that. I mean, in a Kantian uh, understanding of what Plato was doing, I actually do believe that. Now you're telling me that somehow the universe has what exactly that corresponds to my idea of justice? I can answer it for uh, mathematical truth, which is what Roger raised in the first place in 1989. That's, he said the mathematical truths, platonic values, exist uh, not, in the not just in an abstract realm, but physically in the, in the structure of the universe. And then later, ethical and aesthetic values were added in, as well as the, the, the precursors of consciousness. What does it mean for them to exist in the structure of the universe? Well, I mean, they're exists mirrored, in the structure of the they're universe. like, pardon? Well, well everything exists. There. Mat matter comes out of that, energy comes out of that. If, if, if you have a quantum superposition that collapses due to its own uh, uh, self-collapse, Roger's objective reduction, that's defined as consciousness. So we have a, a, a definition or an explanation of consciousness that has ontological distinction. If that happens, it's conscious. It's not just, oh, you get enough computation, co consciousness emerges, which is what the neurocomputationalists say. So we're giving an ontological distinction. If this particular type of collapse that Roger proposed exists, that's a conscious moment. It can happen to an electron, but it takes 10 million years. I don't have time to go into the details, but it's all on, on, in the papers on my website. Andrea? I, yeah. uh, first, I just want to say that um, contrary to what was suggested earlier, we do seem just, to be... Could you just... Oh, sorry. I'm Andrea Hossenstaub. I'm a postdoc. I'm a neurophysiologist. Uh, so we do seem to be exploring some fairly far-flung regions of hypothesis space today. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, um, it seems to me that what you said is that gap junctions are required for the generation of the gamma oscillation and that the gamma uh, oscillation I, I, I is the neural that. correlate of consciousness. So if this is what you're saying, then it's extremely easy to test. And in fact, this test has been performed hundreds, thousands of times every day. The test that you would perform is to administer a drug other than an anesthetic that also has the side effect of blocking gap junctions and look at the effect of administering this drug on consciousness. Um, well, the drugs that they use for prophylactics against malaria, the quinine and quinine derivatives, are extremely potent gap junction blockers. They get into the CNS, and they have dozens of kind of horrible effects on people's um, psychology, ranging from delusions to outright psychosis, but they do not uh, coincide with loss of consciousness. Is this consistent with your theory? First of all, there's, there's at least, uh, can I answer? First of all, there's at least 10 different connections so it, a drug may bind one type of gap junction, not another. There's a knockout mouse model 
that knocks out connection, connection 43. And uh, it, those mice are, are uh, they're very messed up, but as far, we, we don't know if they're conscious. They, they behave, they survive. But the, again, there's like, there's 10 connections and another group called panexins. And it's unclear whether any lesion or any drug affects all of them. So uh, what you said doesn't invalidate what I said. Um, and, it's true and the that, that I, the uh, connections, um, that there are dozens of them, but there's, for the most part, with one or two exceptions, only one is expressed in neurons. That's connection 36, which is blocked by quinine. Uh, connection 43 plus a bunch of panexins. I reviewed this not too long ago. Okay, then this is getting a little bit sophisticated for me. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, Sora, last question Bush, I'm a postdoc here at SOC, and my question is basically an extension of what she was saying. Oh, well, that, do, do are you sure that's not going to get even more sophisticated well, then? Do, do you think Drosophila is conscious because they have gap junctions? Because they what? Drosophila. They have gap junctions. Yeah, made uh, well, that's a good axis. question. Um, you know, at what level of evolution does consciousness appear? And uh, in the model we have, consciousness uh, is defined by E equals H over T. E is the gravitational self-energy of the system. H is Planck's constant over time. So if you set time equal to 25 milliseconds, you need about, uh, you know, 100,000 neurons worth of microtubules in superposition. So if an electron were in superposition it could, uh, and isolated, it would have a conscious moment, but only after 10 million years. So uh, it's a trade-off in, in evolution in terms of a, a, a system large enough to provide, uh, to reach threshold quickly to be useful, um, but also to avoid decoherence. Because the other problem is you have to be isolated. And dendrites in particular are very well suited to avoid uh, decoherence because there's actin gel around the microtubules and they have the gap junctions and so forth. So, um, I have a paper uh, where I uh, did consciousness cause the Cambrian evolutionary explosion. Because when I calculated out the, the, the level at which uh, the system gets large enough to reach threshold in a reasonable time, like a couple hundred milliseconds, is about a 300 neurons. And if you look at the Cambrian evolutionary explosion, uh, small worms and urchins that appeared at the very beginning of the Cambrian explosion were about that size. So I would say the cutoff probably is, is roughly at that level of 300 neurons. Okay, but, and I don't know if, if neurocomputationalists can even hazard a guess because there's no, there's no testable prediction, there's no threshold even suggested from neurocomputation for consciousness. Okay, I think we'd need to move on to Ramachandran at this point. Thank you, Stuart. You're welcome. So, let me just say I have to run off. It's been a pleasure being here, and I'm sorry I couldn't be around for the rest of the I wish Ralph Greenspan were in the room since he talks to Drosophila on a daily basis, but I don't see him. So, uh... Well, I'm delighted to be here as part of the Science Network, and I'd like to thank Terry and uh, Roger for organizing this. It's been a wonderful meeting so far, and I've enjoyed many of the discussions this morning and earlier this afternoon. I enjoyed some of Richard Dawkins' comment, and also a lecture given by Neil, uh, which I enjoyed immensely, but there's one minor point of disagreement. Uh, I think he got something factually incorrect. And that is, he talked about the glories of the Arab civilization, about Baghdad, which I agree with wholeheartedly. But then he referred to Arabic numerals, that they invented the number system as we know it, with zero and numbers. In fact, these should be called Indian numerals. <laughs> they, they actually originated in India in the second century AD, and then were transmitted to the Arabs, and from there to the, to the West. And Western scholars therefore refer to it as, as Arabic numerals. Um, but, you know, that doesn't contradict the spirit of what you're saying, which I agree with. 